Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners, macabre murders and captivating crimes from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 197. Come inching ever closer. Inchworm, inchworm. Towards the episode 200. <laughs> Towards Ooh, 200. We are so close to 200. And we're excited for this because episode 200 means we do something a bit special. We're going to do a retrospective episode. So mm. people, if you've been thinking about all the things you love about the Poisonous Cabinet, and of course you do, day and night. And <laughs> it's, it's all anyone thinks about. Through your work day, you can't do anything. You've been fired because you're thinking about it so much. Please start sending us suggestions of episodes we can revisit, stories we can revisit, chats that we can have, cocktails we can make, anything we can do for the big 200 episode because we will be taking our little seasonal break after that. So get your fixes in while you can. But how are you, Nick? I'm all right. You're all right. All right. Yeah. You feel like you're just like on the edge, <laughs> aren't you? It's just, it's just before the bank holiday weekend, yeah. which is great, but also for retail, hell. It's, yes, it's busy, busy, <laughs> busy, busy time. Busy, busy time. But you have a vat of wine. But I have a vat of wine, so all shall be well. But the Sinead keeps on stealing my vat of wine. Jesus Christ. I mean, he comes in and goes, would you like a glass of wine? And then I take one, and then it's like, And then it's like, well, no, you, you weren't supposed to say yes. <laughs> that was my wine. <laughs> We had this discussion for 10 minutes. I said I can have anything else. No, no, no. Have no, the it's wine. fine. It's <laughs> fine. Have the wine. Have the wine. Have the wine. Oh, you can have the rest. Of- you know what? I'll spit it back in the glass and then you can have it. Yeah, bastard. But good. You're well. It's fine. Fine. I'm fine too. Good. I'm glad. Follow the joys of spring. We've got any poisonings this week? Um. Jesus. I don't think so. No, I've, I've, no. Been, I've been too busy to notice. Maybe you have been poisoning well, maybe, though, in your sleepiness maybe, yes. and in your panic. Maybe I've poisoned myself with panic. Maybe you haven't ordered lots of lovely new sofas, but a shipment of poison. <laughs> yes. Easy mistake to make. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was getting a lovely sofa. You've got a barrel of cyanide. What's going on there? <laughs> <laughs> Quite nice. Chic. Chic. Nice. You can put, make it a nice furniture yes, exactly. feature <laughs> in your room. A nice barrel. Well, that's good. <laughs> Well done, everybody. Well, speaking of accidentally poisoning people through the post, but, you know, being too tired to care about it, really, I think it is time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. Indeed, we should all the barrels for you. So thank you very much this week to Stitch189. To Mariah Underwood. And to the sweet Southern Scientist. Ooh. <laughs> very fancy indeed, very fancy. Very good names from everybody. I like that. We've got some mm. sort of uh, prototype. From one person, we have, the, we have the, the plucky, the plucky sidekick, and they were the evil scientist. The, the sweet southern scientist. The sweet, no evil. Evil. evil? No, if you put sweet in your name, that means you're evil, really. Oh, okay, you're trying enough. to distract people yes. from the it... evil that you do. <laughs> yes. I see, it's, it's like the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the most undemocratic place in the world. It's <laughs> 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 so all those places. If it's got democratic in the name, it's really not. So it's, I think it's, it's a similar sort of thing applies here. <laughs> That's a very good point. They were like, put democratic in there. But just do yeah, it. It's, it's not fooling anyone, but we're going to give it a go. <laughs> Brilliant. We had fun on Patreon this week. Did we? You told a story. Do you remember the lovely story you told? I, yes, I did. Of a man. This man in was Guernsey. Cut. A man in Guernsey. We went to Guernsey for the first time. We got so excited we used the flag as a picture. <laughs> like, oh my God, Guernsey. And Guernsey's a fun place. Apparently so. It turns out. Not yeah. a lot of murdering goes on there. Not a lot. They had to call but when it does, they go... They go big. Yes, and they <laughs> use all sorts of technicalities to stop anyone convicting anyone of murder. Great. Bernard Spilsbury made an appearance. Always fun when dear old he Bernard. Always, he always rocks up. Bernard Spilsbury, again, like, I've, I've not, I need to look up the dates of his life because he seems to, to, 1736 to me. 1736 through to 2012. <laughs> he does seem to span way longer than I think is possible. I'm like, how is he still alive? Why won't they let him retire? I, th- I think potentially it's one of those things that the, his actually son was called Bernard, and there there is always a Bernard Spilsbury in the world. No, but he keeps getting called up as the as, as, as the yeah, chief pathologist. Yeah, but it's just it's it's a different person. He like takes on the mantle of Bernard Spilsbury. So we're like the Dread Pirate Roberts. Yes. <laughs> so actually, it's just a variety of different people, but they they become Bernard <laughs> when when one dies, another one is called or Highlander, <laughs> yes. basically, or the, or the Vampire Slayer. It's a there very, can be very, only one. There can be only one. <laughs> thank you, thank you, you very sexy patron. Patreon subscribers. If you want to know what the hell we're talking about, please consider joining us on patreon.com forward slash the poisonous cabinet where you get extra episodes from us every week as well as lots of bonus content and and people. The lucky Patreon subscribers. And there's more. Oh yeah. The oh, lucky, lucky Patreon subscribers got a sneak peek inside Nick's new flat. Oh, they did. 
at the curtains, at all the paint, at all the wonderful work that has been done, we have shared that with Patreon. We like to share little tidbits from our lives on there, so that's <laughs> from, where from you house. go. From <laughs> Nick's house, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, if you want to stalk us, but don't have the airfare, then that's the place to do it, because we reveal way too much. Way too much. Far, far too much. Yes. You know, I'm, sure well, my, I'm sure my address was in an envelope somewhere in that film. I did look, I did zoom in <laughs> and made sure that one was, so yeah, so people will come and hunt you down as well. And yeah, but pay us money and we'll do more stuff for you on there. Nick always goes, no, he won't. He definitely will. Definitely will. Definitely will. <laughs> well, Nick, are you ready? Yeah. To drink cocktails and talk about poison? Yeah. Or we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. No. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Should we go with the first one? Yeah, go on then. Hooray, hooray, hooray. It is my story this week, but we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell, and it will flavor a cocktail of the week. Master is in my pick. And this week's secret ingredient is the royal mint. The royal mint. The royal mint. Yes. The actual royal mint. The actual mint. It's there. It's yes. not just a mint that got it ideas above its station. <laughs> it is the royal the, mint. Now, the, the temptation was to do something minty. <laughs> Well, I thought you might, and we have had peppermint before. We have had peppermint And we've had coins, and we've had money. Yes. But the Royal Mint is a very specific place. Very specific place that makes money. It does make money. That makes makes the coins. It makes the coins. It makes the coins. It doesn't make the banknotes. That's the Bank of England. Yes, it makes the monies. And credit to people on Instagram, actually on social as well. So a few people went, what? (laughs) And also a couple of people messaged me and going... Does it involve this person? I'm like, yes. How did you? How does everyone know this? And oh, wow. I literally found out about it this week. But yes, but with the royal mint, the royal mint as your inspiration, your ingredient. What have you yes. come up with? We are having some old money. Some old money. Old money. Oh, very good. And that's very apt. Is it? I'm glad it's old. Yes, it's old money. <laughs> it's not new money. It's old. It's not new. Money. Oh, no, we don't do new money don't in this podcast. Money, yes. No, no, only no. old. The unsinkable Molly Brown. Um, yes, yes. Kathy new Bates. money. That's what I took away from Titanic. That she was new money. That's it. I don't know what else happened in that film. No. Did a boat nothing, sink? Nothing, nothing else happened. No, no. fine. Sorry. No. Okay, old money. I have high hopes. Glad. I think it's high time for us to sashay into the poisonous cabinet kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. Well, Nick. Mm. Old money. Old money. Now, it looks very nice. Hmm. Pale. It's yes. got a big chunk of ice in it. Interesting. What could old money denote? Booze, probably. Booze, yes, many booze. All right, cheers. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Oh, hello. Ooh. Oh, that's pleasant. Mm. That's perfectly pleasant. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's got a crispness to it. A little hint of smokiness. A little... Sweetness, I don't know. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, the, yes, all those things. Okay, it's yeah. Is there mezcal in that? There is. <laughs> um, okay, so mezcal. Yep. Lime. Nope. No. Lemon. Yes. Really? Yes. Oh. <laughs> so like sugar syrup or something. Something. Agave. No. Nope. Oh, sugar with sugar. What a syrup? There is a syrup. Is it a honey syrup? It is a honey oh, syrup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah, so yeah, 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 getting there. I like it. I'm getting there. Well, when it tastes sweet and you say it's not sugar, then it's generally honey. <laughs> um, so we've got mezcal. Is there tequila in this as well? There is tequila in this oh, as well. Oh, yes, because you did ask if there's tequila. <laughs> so I, I sort of knew there might you, be tequila. Do you have any tequila? <laughs> oh, okay. So te- tequila and mezcal together at last. Yep. Lemon, honey yeah. syrup. What else? One more thing. One more thing. Something fruity? It is something fruity. Maraschino? Nope. Apricot? Nope. Pears. Yes. Oh, I was guessing. Uh, yeah. I was going through the fruits. I was going. <laughs> but wow. You, you got there soon enough. Oh, the poire William. The poire William. Oh, very, very nice. Now, the, 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 the full disclosure, the recipe calls for a spiced pear <laughs> that I did not Wait. have and I was not going to make or buy. <laughs> <laughs> um, knowing that I had these old poire William looking off in, in the cupboard. So, I, so perhaps it should be more spicy than it is. But, um, no, I like but that. But I think that's very pleasant. I like that a lot. Yeah. It's got a sweetness to it, but a smokiness. Mm. Nice, sharp. Yeah, it's not, it's not as really crisp and cutting as a margarita. Because no. we're in the wheelhouse, but then we've... But well, they, I mean, because this, this is equal parts of everything. Really? Yeah, include, like including it. the honey. So there's actually, mm. there's, there's three quarters of an ounce of honey in that. 
Yeah. Which is a lot more than I was expecting. So, yeah, yeah. so it is it is sweet, which definitely takes off the sharpness you would get with the margarita. Because mm. just the sheer amount of honey. Which but is, I, in this case, the lemon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but which I think works really well. I think it's really nice, yeah. You could dole down on the honey syrup you a little do, bit absolutely. if you want yeah, it you a want little it bit more tart. Yes, but I also I think the pear is probably adding quite a lot of sweetness in there as well. Yes, it's a famously sweet fruit. Yes, so... What a resounding success. But yes, and that's very pleasant indeed. I don't know what it's got to do with old money, though. No, neither have I. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, old money, like, I get... No. No, I don't. I, no, I don't, no idea. I mean, they're all old-ish yes. drinks. <laughs> They've existed. Yes, I Honey, that's that's old. Was the mark of someone rich for a while. I have access to bees. <laughs> okay, well, lovely. Well, with old money firmly mm. in hand because we're fancy. Yes. Are you ready for a story? Oh yes. So this story, thanks to Janet or MC on Instagram, who sent a message and just went, look into this person. And they're connected with this person. I went, oh my God, everything else out the window. This is what we're doing this week. So thank you so much, Janet. There's great sources from Oxford University. I'm not going to say what they are because it gives it away. And a wonderful book by Thomas Levinson as well. So such good articles and such good content out here. But this week, Nick, we are telling the tale of a con artist. Oh. A fraudster. Oh. A purveyor of weird goods. Nice. And ill-gotten gains. Like him already. Who fell afoul. One of the greatest minds in history. <gasps> is it me? Not to my knowledge, <laughs> unless your time traveling machine has been perfected. Yes, it does. And it's also about a crisis in English currency. A crisis in currency. Yes, and okay. lots of bad money. Mm, okay. <laughs> this is the madcap story of William Choliner, who almost ruined the English economy and his famous rivalry with Sir Isaac Newton. Oh. I have never heard of this man. Never. Did, weren't expecting that, were no, you? No. I've heard of Isaac Newton, but I've not heard of this other chap. Uh, Isaac Newton. Do you know about his connections with money? No. No? No. I that. know he had an apple and he lived in Grantham. <laughs> he had an apple and he took it for his wife. Yes. Yes. Well, you will learn all very okay, shortly good. here. So this is a story intertwining these two lives. There's lots of good tidbits in here as well. Information about some of our favourite places in London. It's packed with detail, so I hope you enjoy this ride. But let's start with William himself, William Choliner. So he was born in Warwickshire around 1650. Now, not much is known about his childhood. We have limited records. We know he was the son of a weaver. Nice. But he was poor. He was poor. There's a brother and a sister. Somewhere. Somewhere, like somewhere the, around the, yeah. there. Most of the biographies about this man were written after his death, like right after his death by sensationalist writers going, <laughs> and here are all the tales that are definitely true about him. Mm. So we will include some of these, but also take those with a pinch of salt. Okay. But we're doing our best here. But we've got some other very good references to the other people in the story. So no education, as you can imagine. He is illiterate. For a long time, something of a troublemaker. His biographer would later say he had an elastic moral sense. Nice. Mm. Like it. He, he obviously caused enough trouble that his father ended up sending him to Birmingham at a young age. Just be gone. Be go go get to out. Birmingham. You shall go to Birmingham. He would become a nail maker's apprentice okay. in Birmingham. Whether that was what his father intended or whether he just struck gold when he was there. Now, I know what you're thinking. Nails. Good, sensible profession. Well, everyone needs nails. Yep, it keeps you on the straight and narrow. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a good money in nails. But no, William had interests in other types of metal work. <laughs> mm. He liked hinges. <laughs> <laughs> I want to deal in brackets. <laughs> no, he got into... Screws. Groat making. Oh, Nice. A nice groat. Everyone loves a groat. Everyone loves a groat. Now, a groat is not currently in circulation no, in not English currently. currency. Hasn't been for some time, I feel. No, no, for a while. <laughs> I think it was the 1800s that actually yeah. officially phased out. But a groat is equivalent to about four, four pence. pence. Yes, yes, well done. Though it did change. To eight pence. To eight pence and then a shilling. Just about a shilling. Yeah. How the fuck do you know I, so much I, about I, groats? I know weird shit. <laughs> Why do you know so much about groats? I don't know. It probably came up in like a black adder or something, and I went, "What's a groat?" And I googled <laughs> it, and then I just, it's just stuck in my head. There are a lot of groat references in black adder. <laughs> I was running like one groat. Yes. <laughs> 
But Birmingham is kind of the centre of grope making right. at the time. So, so this is the thing with currency at the time, coins in particular, banknotes later on, but coins, everyone's using coins. Yeah, absolutely. But they're shitty coins. They're shitty, shitty coins in general across the place. There's a whole big problem going on. But groats, very easy to counterfeit. And they would be known as the Birmingham groat. That you could so easily counterfeit them mm. and then put them into circulation. And William started to learn this trade. So he sort of moved away from the nail maker and said, hello, growth man, can I work with you? <laughs> and he learned this trade and he's pretty adept. So he's learned a few skills. Into the 1680s, he strikes out for London and literally walked. He couldn't get straight into coin counterfeiting. Well, prob- probably not, no. It's, no. I think it's a, you've got to work your way up, I feel, in, the, in such yes. an industry. Well, given that London is, uh, yeah, it's a huge, heaving, amazing metropolis to him at that time, but also lots of guilds, yes. lots of guilds. And even amongst the criminals, like you must be an apprentice to someone before you can come along with your coin making oh, ways. You, So he spends a few years sort of bopping around and trying to find different trades. Now, it would be very easy for a young ruffian like him trying to earn his rights to go straight into a life of theft and robbery. But no, William doesn't he takes his time he starts an entirely different line of work while remaining in the manufacturing game okay now what happens between him getting to this next sentence i'm going to say <laughs> i don't know but he is he has not become a pickpocket he is not just robbing houses or stuff like that okay. he has used his skills to manufacture items and what he has manufactured and i'm going to use the phrase that was used at the time he began to make tin watches with didos in them Right. Dodos means dildos. How do you? How does one have one fit in a watch? <laughs> he was hawking these around the streets for a few loose pence. Now, dildos. Dildos yes. was his trade. Now, over the years, people are kind of taking that this is literally what was written: tin watches with dildos in them. Now, we 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 don't know if we can decipher this as these are novelty pocket watches. I'm thinking a dildo with a watch in. So you, can, <laughs> so you can set it to so time. You can, so you can time yourself. <laughs> because everyone's in a rush exactly. while using one. Yeah, exactly. I've got five minutes, quick. <laughs> to the dildo, you're set yelling it, at set it. Set it to the timer. <laughs> looking at it. Anyone of a sensitive disposition, by the way, there's dildos in this. You're, you're here now. You're with us. So people don't know whether it's a novelty watch with like, you open the watch and, oh, it's a big cock. Um, right. Or We're a picture of pa- it. Painted on the, on the tin or yes, something. Yes, or pictures or anything like it. Was, there was, you know, one Telescopic. Of the you open it and it's going, <laughs> <laughs> It's like those snakes in a can. <laughs> oh, it could be. And then you get a use out of it in the end. There was one writer who was saying about like, okay, the spring mechanisms of watches, maybe he had been... No, there's no way. I think you're over, no overthinking it, mate. No, he was overthinking. He was like, there's no way he would have known how to do that. But others have reported it just that he was selling dildos. That he was like, pocket watch also, would you like a dildo with your watch? And this is the time of, you know, of, of sexual progression behind the scenes, yes. as it were. But I'm not sure I would want a tin one. No, it's a tin watch. Yes. But the dildo, fine. Uh, but, but, but he, he's obviously skilled in metalwork. Nick, don't you know about the trade in Italian dildos? <laughs> I, I fear you're going to tell me. Because there was one. <laughs> I'm sure there was. And the information on it is limited to that. That there was a big old trade for the last 20 years in the finest of Italian dildos. Well, I imagine they're beautifully carved. Beautifully carved. Maybe from leather. Again, you know, Florence... The Ponte Vecchio, there's the, you get a lot of leather on there and, you know, maybe you just ask, also, like, no, a handbag I, I, or they're, a dildo. They're probably like ivory or... Uh, Jesus. Ex- exquisite <laughs> woods. Exquisite woods or ivory. Ebony. That poor elephant, uh, Jesus. Yeah, I don't think they cared much about the elephants back in the day. <laughs> Carving it wild, cutting it off. <laughs> it's like the finest cock. <laughs> exactly. Look at, look at those tusks. That's, that's 12 <laughs> cocks worth of tusks there. <laughs> I love the way you went to Ivory so quickly. These are fancy, fancy people. Fancy, You're yeah. on the streets. You're not selling these immediately. I mean, yes, of course, the King's Courts would have had yes, them. Well, that's why what you're saying. He's got, he's got tin one. Who wants a tin one? I don't know if it's tin. That's the thing. The t- there was a tin watch and maybe the... Or it if was- he's making them. Yeah, but he could also whittle wood, I'm sure, and make other things. Or out of leather. It's a branch. <laughs> 
I found some sticks. <laughs> what I is... There you go. <laughs> That's a log. That's no, dildo, mate. <laughs> dildo. Do you not know what they look like? <laughs> oh, yeah, you square. Yeah, I know, I totally... <laughs> Husband comes home, wife? <laughs> wife, I bought you some twigs. <laughs> this will spice up our marriage, no less. I know of the Italian ways. But that's what he's doing that's on the street. Doing. That's right. what he is doing. Okay. Since Cromwell died, there's been quite the line in dildos. Absolutely. But he has these saucy watches. Or do you want to watch? Here's a dildo. <laughs> but the thing about him, <laughs> which you'd hope he'd have while selling sex toys on the street, potentially, is the gift of the gap. That he's a great salesman. Yes. So yes. he is very adept at charming people at talking his way into favor and out of bad situations really helped his career so he's been selling these little wares on the street he then branches out of course into the usual palm reading yep. bit of fortune telling nice trick of bringing people in who have lost something is it a dildo <laughs> where is where is my dildo? Where, where is it, where's it, where's it gone? Have you checked the obvious places? Right, okay, we can check everywhere else. No, people have lost something. He's like, I can divine where it is. I can find it for you. He does. He does. Oh my goodness, this missing item. I have found it. He's stolen it in the first place. He's stolen stuff from them. I'm also sorry. I'm going back to the dildos. I knew you wouldn't be able to let this go. No, and I, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm also I'm loving the idea of divination by dildo. <laughs> so, Isn't that a thing? I, I have no idea. <laughs> but I'm thinking just like tossing a selection on the floor and then analysing how they land. <laughs> like, you do that with the I Ching and things like that. You sort of, the sticks you throw and, they, and then you interpret how things land. And the stick, I'm sure it's much the same with dildos. He could, maybe he did bring the dildos in to his divination practices. And that's why he was so popular. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. He did branch out also into quackery so as well as having this scam of i'm going to steal something from you and then basically divine where it is by the magic forces to sell it to get it back to you but yeah he branched into quackery also at the time called a piss pot prophet nice nice like it cures for the plague cures for the plague i can give them to you cures for your cold little something to help your marriage (laughs) money please what's this it's a cure it looks like a dildo (laughs) we don't know what that is but fine we'll take one So, yes, his biographer wrote he had the best, (laughs) and this isn't going to help your little asides here. I don't know what you mean. Having the best knack at tongue pudding. Right. I I don't know why you find that amusing, to be honest. I'm just leaving it there. He established himself as a quack doctor and a soothsayer, pretending to sell wenches what sort of husbands they should have also all these stolen goods and things like that but yes an expert in having a knack at tongue pudding tongue pudding tongue pudding okay. which is a nice way of being a sweet talker sweet talker, yes. sweet talker that is what i thought yeah that's fine You're just i've left it there and i'm sure we'll come back to it <laughs> he's doing fine doing all this quackery stuff he's not making a huge amount of money it should be said he does marry at some point at some point he marries and has children there's limited information he marries a woman and but she doesn't figure in the story so i'm not going to include her name because she's a girl <laughs> Quite right. (laughs) He had to knock the petty crimes on the head. At one point, he's implicated in a burglary in 1690 when this is one of the records of his actions. And he had to hide out for a spell. Leave the city for a bit. While he's lying low, he meets a man whose profession is called a Japaner. Now, I need to explain that. That is a term for finishing surfaces. Is that like lacquer work? Yes, Japanese lacquer. Is that Japanese lacquer work? Yes. Japanese lacquer work. So not very nice phrase, but it's just an expression. Don't mm-hmm. want to cause any offence there. But yes, huge, huge trade in that of Absolutely, like using yeah. Japanese lacquer to improve furniture, improve goods, improve clothes as well. Yeah, I, mean, I think it was also quite the thing for like well-to-do ladies to sort of do their mm. sort of Japan work and things like that is to sort of yeah, emulate these sort of really beautiful things that are coming over from major and stuff yeah and so yeah no indeed yes it's a big thing it is a big thing but it's also a very good knockoff trade because mm. if you use it right you can make a knackered old piece of furniture or a piece of clothing look brand look new really cool and yeah. then you can sell it on and you can sell it on to someone with, with delusions of grandeur upcycle darling it's upcycled upcycling <laughs> that's what we call it now but yeah all of these side hustles that he was using led him back and back again to his true profession where his true talents lay still lose. <laughs> if only if only it had gone that way and I would there must be stories out there of the oh, great dildo be. makers of all time death, death by dildo 
<laughs> Jesus, uh, you take it to a dark place every well, time. Well, I'm sorry, we're a murder podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we're a true crime podcast. Maybe they use the dildo to intimidate someone to get into I mean, a bank vault. That, I mean, that's true. Intimidation, they can be quite intimidating. They can be quite intimidating. So, yeah, that's, that's a fair point. That's a story for another time. People that write in with your knowledge of dildo-related crimes. <laughs> But the more he delved into these side projects, the more contacts he got, the more able he was to branch out into counterfeiting, which was the underhand trade at the time. He studied under a goldsmith named Patrick Coffey. And by 1691, he was a fully fledged counterfeiter. Now, a counterfeiter, if anyone needs to know right now, it is making fake coins. A crime for which men would be hanged, Mm -hmm. women burned at the stake. Yeah. Yeah, so bad, so bad it is. Um, A huge business because, as I referred to earlier, and I'm going to come on to, British coins at the time, a horrific state. Not good quality, yes. Not good quality, and the country is in crisis in the 1690s. They have been for a little while, Mm. actually, but really it's reaching its peak. So much so that the government had to take drastic action to save their economy. Around 10 to 20% of coins in circulation are fakes. (laughs) God. In the 1690s. For years, the silver coins in circulation had been clipped so mm. much that they were no longer viable. You know what clipping is? It's like just taking a little bit off the edges and things like that. Shaving it. Like shaving yeah. off the edge and then melting them down. I can make a new coin. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You can use the little bits of coin maybe yeah. to get some mead, but mainly clip enough, make some new coins. Who yeah. the big stamp. Now, the, the reason that you can't do that anymore and what started at this time and had started just beforehand is the milled edges. Yeah, the little patterning around the sides. Yes, the patterning around the sides. So people had introduced that in the cast that you have to make the coins, create stuff around the edges as well as on the top and on the bottom that people can't replicate. Mm. So you can immediately spot that there is a fake coin and if it's been shaved or clipped, you'll be able to see it in the pattern. But... The practices that were happening weren't very good. <laughs> they were just, they were introducing them. It was flawed. Good counterfeiters had molds already yeah. of these. Well, you just get is one decent coin. Yeah. And you can make a mold out of it. Exactly. <laughs> so it's exactly it's... what they were doing. Yeah. <laughs> and they could do this. And people were allegedly also just like sneaking in and like getting molds off mm. the actual coin makers and everything. So William joins a gang. And he joins a number of gangs. He starts recruiting really, really good counterfeiters from across the city with different skills. He builds up all of these contacts and has so many contacts around the city that he's able to sort of spread his expertise, spread his knowledge and his contacts around there, but never sort of be implicated in just one set of counterfeiting. And he is soon churning out fake guineas and the French pistols. Mm-hmm. which is a coin that is worth 17 shillings. Oh, quite a lot. Mm. Yes, that's I think it was William III, and we're in the reign of William sign. III, who introduced it. I didn't look massively into the no. history of the pistols no, of the coins. No, that's fine. But they're there. They're, they're there. there. He would work with coffee, the goldsmith, and also engravers. He would work with them to create the best possible coin. You know, it, it, and they are incredibly mm. good. People can't see the difference. Pass them on to crooks who will then pass them into circulation. So different people, always distance, get them into circulation. He was so successful and admired for his work. I mean, he was sought after. He was Mm. sought after by people. The coins were close to perfection. And he made a steady trade and was able to buy a fancy house in Knightsbridge. Oh, that's very fancy. Nice Knightsbridge. Ditched his wife and kids. Hooked up with a sexy young filly. Marvellous. Yes, yes. She had a name as well. Um, All the girls, I'm sorry in this. There were so many girls who were just like, that. no one referred to their um, names massively. (laughs) And he swanned about, as was described, in gentleman's clothing. Good for him. And people noted this as like, he is walking around as a gentleman. In a fine carriage, he buys plate (gasps) for himself. This counterfeiter having enough money to buy plate for his household. (laughs) He also had a house in Egham in Surrey where he did his forging because it's outside the bounds of London and also it's remote enough that no one will notice the massive amounts of noise going on (laughs) inside. Yes, a lot of banging and clattering. With various (laughs) machines. They have machines in there and they get them in and just like, what's going on in there? Nothing. Don't worry. It's sheep. A new mechanical sheep. (laughs) (laughs) He was known soon to be the best counterfeiter in England and he was not subtle in his extravagance. He would boast about his skills. As I said, he just swanned around London, very, very happy about what he was doing. Occasionally, he'd have to go into hiding when his associates were arrested. Mm. And they tried to give him up. They tried to give his name. He simply would make enough fake money that he could take it away and disappear. 
So yeah. if he could, he would disappear until the heat died down, i.e. that person was hanged, did <clears throat> nothing to save them. Oh, my God, no. And then well, he came if, they're, if, they're, if they're trying to pin it on him, why should he try and save them? Oh, yeah. And he will use this tactic yeah. many times. And, uh, yeah, loyalty is not his thing as well. Well, it's not their thing. If they're, put, if they're pointing the finger, they've been caught and going, oh, it's him over there, it's him. Oh, I think as soon as they're caught, he runs. Oh, okay. As soon as they're caught, he runs. <laughs> Yeah, doesn't well, doesn't make any effort to help them. Goes, I am going to hide. I never knew this man. I do not know you, sir. Yes. To supplement his sometimes tricky counterfeiting trade, he also became an agent provocateur. Oh. <gasps> you know what that means. Yes. He put on sexy, sexy underwear. Sexy, sexy Sexy class. underwear. <laughs> I mean, he has the dildos. <laughs> he went for the sexiest clothes. The could. sexiest thing. He for, used... for, for, for whom? Well, he uses the fear of Jacobite plots because uh... obviously we've just come out of the Stuart period mm -hmm. so james the second i believe and we're into i'm william very III. very fuzzy around that area i will say this right now i don't know a lot about william III's reign nope. i messaged tim tim cloak our darling historian and he won't mind me saying this because he knows so much and i said listen by the way do you know anything about this reign any just tidbits of history and he went i can answer immediately this is a black spot yeah <laughs> i know nothing <laughs> <laughs> i was like give me 50 years before 50 yeah, years it's after it's like a bit of a and i he have can no idea what off. happened <laughs> yeah it's just it's weird actually william the third this is like people if you want to start a podcast do it about william the third's reign <laughs> just do it it was obviously very boring it was very boring <laughs> but yes after james so you've got the jacobite sympathizers <laughs> and that's bad for william the third but what he does is he pays for Jacobite sympathisers to print copies of the recently disposed James II's declaration that denounces William, King William. Oh. He goes, you go and print this. Yeah, I'm totally with you, totally with you, totally, totally with you. Totally, go, go and deliver it. it to my house, deliver it to my house. Yeah, yeah, it's good. And they come back and go, we've got the pamphlets. And William's standing there with the police. Yeah. Yeah. They arrest the traitors, take them off, kill them. Mm. And thank you, thank you, thank you, William. Thank you, William. So nice of you. Well Sound answer you. Loyal, loyal subject. Well done, you. Have a thousand pounds. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's his most famous lucrative scam in order to just be an agent provocateur. And um, he tries it multiple times. He does all these sorts of things about, like, saying, there's going to be an attack on Dover Castle. There's going to be all sorts of things going around. And he, he's sort of successful, but very quickly it becomes dangerous. Mm. So he abandons that. He goes back to coinage, dabbles in fake banknotes for nice. a bit, 1695. So the Bank of England is just going like, here, here's some banknotes. And he's like, I'm getting it on that. <laughs> At one point, a forged note, it was traced back to a printer that William had used. William immediately turns King's evidence. Instantly. Oh. Names every single one of his conspirators in the <laughs> banknote con. Tells them about another plot about the Bank of England that he had started, <laughs> that he had instigated. I will tell you everything about it. Bank arrests all these people. Oh, you traitors. And they're going, like, oh, you liars, liars. Hangs them. The Bank of England ends up thanking William, gives him £200 reward. <laughs> I mean, he's clever. He's a clever kid. <laughs> he's not a nice man. <laughs> morally? But he's... Morally, not so good. He's looking after number one. Yeah. More of his accomplices are hanged for forgery while he walks away scot-free. Around this time, he takes a pretty bold step, though. He's going to present himself as a legitimate expert of all things coinage. Okay. Now, he's the master counterfeiter, mm. and he has used aliases, so no one of high society, no one really knows who he is, apart from very close associates of him. He's going to accuse the Royal Mint of being in an estate of complete disarray. Okay. And here we come to the Royal Mint. Mm -hmm. Yay! <laughs> and there's going to be more of that. <laughs> He publicly accuses the Royal Mint of incompetence, that they do not know what they're doing. There are thieves amongst them. There are people bringing out all the dye that you use to set mm. coins. Oh, it's absolutely terrible. I can spot the forgeries a mile off. I must give you the information. You must use me as an expert. He wants to get into the Royal yeah, he Mint. Wants a job. <laughs> this attracts the attention of key people in government. Now, as I've said, I'll refer back to the fact that England's economy is in quite the state because of all the fake coins doing the rounds, which is not only bad if you're buying your grains for the week, but also the value of British silver is dropping below yeah. that of other countries. And William III can barely afford the war he's raging with France. <laughs> That becomes a problem. When you can't afford the war, then that's when you know stuff's bad. <laughs> and also, it's a war against Louis XIV. It's like, oh, that man has money. He fancy. Come on. <laughs> At the start of 1696, Parliament passed the Act 
for remedying the ill state of the coin in the kingdom. Nice. And this is where the government effectively do a do-over of all money. <laughs> the coins. Let's going to start again. Yes. <laughs> Literally that. They get all of the silver coin plate bullion and melt that shit down. <laughs> and go, no, there's no... No, we're doing the money again. We're doing the money again. We are going to reform all of this. All of these coins. We're going to get it out of circulation. How they manage the gap in between. I mean, how, I mean, how do you actually manage that? Getting all the money in. It is over a several. It's over several pe- yeah. several years or like you know. It's it, well the way it's written. Actually, it's not that long. <laughs> but they're like, no, we're going to melt everything down. And no more coins for you, any of you. I suppose there will be a lot less coins in circulation than there are now. Well, because they most <laughs> of them can't be used. Yeah. And the banknotes have come out as well. New methods were introduced to ensure the coins could not be clipped or copied, but help was still needed, Nick. Mm. Help was needed not just by the economists in the treasury or the goldsmiths. They needed the finest minds in England to determine how the country's money could be protected. They needed Sir Isaac Newton. (laughs) Okay. And I think that's a drinks break. Yeah, I mean, you you ended on a cliffhanger there. (laughs) Nick, we have our drinks. <laughs> we do. And we have Sir Isaac Newton. Apparently so, yeah. I did. I forgot about him. So, and here <laughs> oh, he he's here. Here he is. He is. Daddy of modern science, spotter of apples, yeah. champion of gravity. I, was he much one for the safe cracking what? or designing? Well, you see what he wanted to, they wanted looking for more security. Do they, they not want people to build safes? And... No, it's not security. It's, it's to perfect the art of, of making coins. Oh, right. Coins I, that could not be... Okay. Here it is. Astronomer, polymath, philosopher, man who had a theory or two about light and colour, <laughs> and those two together. But did you know about his time at the Royal Mint, Nick? I, I should, Now you say it, I knew he was there. He was there. He was there. I have no In idea what background. he did, but yes, I do remember, yes, but he was at the Royal Mint. If history is to be believed, he not only was there, but he was something like a James Bond Nice. while he was there. The then Chancellor of the Exchequer and his patron, Charles Montague, offered Newton the role of Warden of the Mint in 1696. Now, Newton needs this gig because he's he's been in Cambridge before mm. now. I'm not going to go into the whole history of Newton. There's too much. There's a lot There's of it. too much. He's not had a good time there. But mm. I do like to think of the idea of the Chancellor of the Exchequer going, we need Isaac Newton. And him just finding him in a bar drinking a whiskey, like, I always knew the Royal Mint would come knocking for me one day. Oh, you want the ultimate commemorative coin that will live in a drawer and then be given to our grandchildren one day. Well, I just can't do it. Newton is offered the role. Will you be the warden of the Mint? And it's it's a bit of a just a non-role. Yeah. Like, it's kind of administrative. And he goes, okay, I can move away from Cambridge. He's had a rough time there. No one ever went to his lectures. Mm. At Cambridge. No one turned up. No one did. He's like, but I have an apple. (laughs) I have a theory. (laughs) I have a theory. I have many, many important, very, very important theories. Why won't you listen? (laughs) I can only imagine he's a bit boring. Mm. However, his actions, he's methodical. He's methodical. That's his thing. He's a good scientist. He's a very good scientist. So he accepts the role of Warden of the Mint. And this is, as I said, is meant to be a salaried post. Normally had little to no responsibility. Just sort of like... Great fun. You get to swan around the Tower of London. Yeah. Having a grand old time. Oh, yes, yes. No, he embraces this with gusto. Okay. And it's good that you've mentioned that the Mint is in the Tower of London because I will come back to what the Mint looked like in the Tower of London. And so this is from an article on the archive by Lee D'Amato. And he said about what Isaac Newton did at the Mint is he took careful notes on every aspect of the coining process, the amount of coal the furnace burned, the capacity of the melting pots over time, the optimal shift men and horses could turn the mill before tiring. He calculated an efficient pace for the work, overseeing repairs of old facilities, constructions of new ones. Under his command, the Mint went from struggling to produce £15,000 a week to over £50,000 with ease. Good for him. Good for him. Nicely done. Yes. Now, I will have a little aside here about what the Mint was like under Sir Isaac and what it was like for Sir Isaac from there, because it's quite fun. And this is where some of the resources from the University of Oxford, and they have this whole project, the Newton Project it's called, but they have this great resource online about Newton at the Mint. And the detail of it is fantastic. They've done amazing work. The, the history of the Royal Mint is fascinating. These days, it's, it's a very admin-heavy place in yeah. Wales. Moved to Wales in 1968. But the Royal Mint had, since the 13th century, been housed at the Tower, the of, Tower London, of London. And there it remained until 1812. Now, the Tower of London, again, prisoners are there. And also a lot of other shit. 
Yeah, there's a lot going on there. A lot of other people. So this is from Newton and the Mint from by Oxford University. The Mint occupied a tight space between the interior and exterior walls. On each side of the narrow paved Mint Street, as it was called, there were workshops, stores, stables, coach houses and residencies. There was an assortment of ancient wooden buildings of one or two stories, some held up by timber shores and pinned together with iron clamps. The warden's house, which came as part of the job, was so gloomy and dilapidated <laughs> that Newton chose instead to live in Jeremy Street, half an hour's walk from the tower. Fair enough. The tower was shared by many different working communities and families, and there were different entrances and spaces for different visitors, whether they were merchants, goldsmiths, tourists, such as as Samuel Pepys, or the Tsar of Russia, who came on a visit, or contracted workers. Mint Street was cramped, dark and dangerous, lit only by four oil lamps at night, and patrolled by single sentries who varied in their trustworthiness. <laughs> <laughs> I think at this point, like, Tower of London is like 700 years old <laughs> at this point. <laughs> so and they're building shit in there. <laughs> um, and it's just, like, everything is crammed in there. Yeah. Uh, and if you go to the Tower of London today, obviously, you see the, the existing stone structure in the outside and the huge area that you can kind of walk yeah. around now. There would have been loads There'd of There would have been stuff. loads of like wooden buildings yeah. and everything crammed in all there. And, there was a, and the, the, the Royal Menagerie was there as well. The Menagerie. And they had, had all the animals and polar bears and lions and elephants <laughs> and all this sort of shit running around the place as well. The polar bear dated back to the 1200s, <laughs> yes. But the Menagerie was there. There were all sorts of other things. You'll enjoy this as well. So there would be fights aplenty. Mm. Fights aplenty in the, in the tower between the inhabitants, not just just criminals trying to break into the mint. You can imagine Isaac Newton just trying to keep things calm in the mint. The towers was also shared by the British Board of Ordnance. For those who don't know, that's a secondary arm of the Royal Navy and Guns. Army. Guns! Supply of cannon, weapons and powder and ammunition of all kinds. And Newton had to submit an official request that read that the gunner of the tower do order that the guns in such a manner that upon firing they may do the least harm to the glass windows of the mint. <laughs> like, please, please don't aim your guns at us. <laughs> stop trying to kill the money. He had to repeatedly appeal for fewer people be allowed to inhabit the tower because they were getting into fights. People were trying to go, I need to come into the mint and no outsider is allowed in the mint. Mm. And But also it's just ramshackle. It's like, don't, you can't come in here but i want to see the money and also i like money yes and there's tourists coming to see the line of kings which is a whole like life-size structure things and yes lions lions mm. there were lions the menagerie had calmed down a bit from polar bears but there were still lions <laughs> that people came to watch and just all sorts of other animals jackals and just hawks yeah flying around so it's enough work for him to be focused on and trying to fix money at the time <laughs> just fight all of this and also can there be money now <laughs> But Newton loves a challenge. Yeah, that's true. The one thing he didn't want to do was pursue counterfeiters. He, okay. he said that he didn't want to do it. He was the job of the warden, but he thought it was beneath him. It was beneath uh -huh. his station to pursue criminals. Well, personally, like running after them down the street. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that, that absolutely beneath him. Mm -hmm. But then he was told, no, go and do it. Okay. And <laughs> run, by... run, Newton, run. <laughs> by God, he did, Nick. <laughs> by God, he did. He was tasked to find out who had sold on a set of dye. That's the cost for the coins. And he reluctantly went out and did his job to perfection. Of course he did. As in not only methodically interviewing inmates of Newgate Prison, talking to everyone he could, building up a roster of contacts, of information. He would go in disguise to taverns and bars and ask about counterfeiters nice. around the world. Maybe as... I love to think that he was going as a toothless prostitute. Um, <laughs> Freshen your drink, governor. Apples. Um, apple, Lovely apple. apples. <laughs> Would you like an apple, sir? Apple. No, I don't like apples. Uh, you know what? Fuck you. All right? Do you know how important these are? I saw one full... You know what? It doesn't matter. He was, he was just there on top of the Tower of London throwing apples at people. <laughs> See? It It works. <laughs> I sat under an oak tree once really was it a sexy oak tree you're not listening to the science <laughs> also light can you imagine Isaac Newton in a pub trying <laughs> to dumb it down of like I'm, I can't do this can't. but he did he did he got enough contact because he's so methodical he's like if I'm going to go and do this job I'm going to do it to a 
crazy level of detail and power to him because he absolutely nailed every single job that he did. Was he a fun person to be around? Probably not. Probably not. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what he was like as a person. Maybe some people know about that. So he's out. He's out in the taverns every single night. And he starts to hear about one William Chaloner. Hmm. <gasps> now, this is the time where Newton's at the Royal Mint. Chaloner continues to lambast the mint, publicly mm. saying the mint is run by idiots. It's an absolute piss take in there. And it's oh. one thing to slag off the old system, but when Newton's there, it's like, really? Come nah, at me. I've made changes, mate. So. Yeah, I've made changes, and I will fight you on this. Mm. I have details in my head. <laughs> Chaloner demands to be shown inside the mint. And he gets an audience with the House of Commons and with the Justice of the Peace, various people insisting that he knows what's wrong with the mint he mm. knows what's wrong with the mint because of you know just contacts that he has not admitting that he's a criminal but saying that i have been working with different people and i can show you exactly what's wrong with the mint because look at this counterfeit coin i can tell you what's wrong with it because i'm a master at spotting these and things also i made it exactly <laughs> he is a master at spotting these things and they are believing him yeah. they want to let him into the mint and they say well actually yes let's hit him in newton refuses basically no. standing in the doorway going it is Go i have taken an oath not to let outsiders in <laughs> to the mint you are not coming in and they're like oh, okay fine William is foiled Newton's anger is ignited that year in 1696 William is arrested on suspicion of being linked to criminal gangs mm. you know have you committed some crimes as soon as he's in there um, he tells the Lord Justices that the mint is rife with false coins that staff are stealing the stamps and the moulds and giving them to counterfeiters that he knows sells all of his associates down the river insists every single one of them, oh yeah, you want names? I'll give you names. I'll give you names. I've never made a guinea in my life. He mm. says that in court. I've never made a guinea in my life. He's implying crimes have been committed. Newton has to actually take the stand to defend himself Eesh. in front well, of this person going, ideal. I just, what? Yeah. <laughs> William is released. He's, he doesn't face charges. Many of his associates are taken off and hanged. Newton now is like, okay. Okay, this man has annoyed me. I am now building a case against him. It is my job to catch counterfeiters, and that's what I'm going to do. Nice. So he spends a couple of years literally building a case against William, not just taking records, but as I said, going out and going undercover to talk to as many people as possible so he has a stack of evidence that is airtight. It is completely airtight, and it's above and beyond what other people would do at this time, mm. but he will not be, he will not be fooled. <laughs> He will not be beaten. It wasn't until 1699 when William Cholner was picked up for lottery ticket fraud. Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, just gets weirder. Going yeah. out for the lottery. All I can say is there were lotteries at the time. Mm. There were, actually. Queen Elizabeth introduced lotteries as fun, as fun. This was a lottery against, I think it was the duties on the rise in a certain grain tax. I think you could gamble against them, oh, mm. but you could gamble for money. You could have the lottery ticket for money, but he had forged a lottery ticket, sold it to a pawnbroker. That was what Newton had him on. Newton got him on this forged lottery ticket, picked him up, and then levied two more charges against him, producing fake coins and for forging French pistols, mm. those coins. At trial, William Cholner stood before Judge Sir Salathiel Lovell, who was known as the hanging judge. Oh, good. Oh, mm. gosh. <laughs> uh, interesting side note, Daniel Defoe wrote of him, he trades in justice and the souls of men and prostitutes them equally to gain. This judge, not a lot is said about this story, but also as a side note, that judge was insane. Uh, yes, uh, the hanging judge, people have heard of the hanging judge. Yeah, that's him, that's yeah. him. Daniel Defoe wrote that about him. Mm. That judge took such revenge on Daniel Defoe. Very complicated series of punishments <laughs> that judge gave him. He was known as, let's hang everyone. Let's hang everyone. So it doesn't bode well. No, doesn't bode well. not encouraging. What also doesn't bode well is Newton has an army of witnesses. And who are those witnesses, though? Because William has sent all of his compasses to the gallows. Mm, fair point. But they had wives. Oh, nice. It is a series of his accomplices' wives. <laughs> Who come up and can testify? I saw him yes. making these coins. And I'm already quite pissed off. You've murdered my husband. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Several of the wives of his accomplices, also friends who have been screwed over, all line up to say, "I saw him do this. Nice. I saw him do that." All comes back to haunt him. They give details of his lies, his crimes, his wealth, and a guilty verdict is delivered to a stunned William within a mm. matter of minutes. Um, he fakes insanity through okay. the trial 
Uh, it was said he struggled and flounced about for life like a whale struck with a harping w- iron. Nice. No, Once there's... he knows he's not getting out of the situation, William sort of breaks down completely. It begins writing multiple letters to Isaac Newton, mm-hmm. begging him to pardon him, calling every man and woman who spoke against him as a liar, as a criminal. He has no loyalty, no regard for anyone. Mm. He has flaunted his expertise, his criminality in the face of the authorities. He has sold everyone he knows down the river. He's only ever sought to help himself. But you know what? Do me a favour, Do me, do me a favour, mate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of his last letters, and I'll read this as it's written. Oh, dear sir, do this merciful deed. Oh, my offending, you has brought this upon me. Oh, for God's sake, if not mine, keep me from being murdered. Oh, dear sir, nobody can save me but you. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I shall be murdered unless you save me. Oh, I hope God will move your heart with mercy. Pity. Do this thing for me. I am your near murdered humble servant. I'm assuming it didn't have much impact. Mm, Isaac Newton doesn't reply. Yeah. (laughs) No. So William would go to the gallows on the 22nd of March. 1699 refused to see a priest refused Mm. to the sacrament refused to believe it was happening protested his innocence he was hanged he twitched before a crowd before being disemboweled oh nice Nice. how jolly at the end newton would prosecute 28 coiners in total and he would continue to serve at the royal mint and was made master of the mint until his death he was also the only the second scientist to be knighted after francis bacon Mm. He died in 1727 in his sleep. Interesting side fact, his hair was later examined, found to contain traces of mercury. And it's thought the mercury poisoning may have explained his slightly erratic (laughs) behaviour at the end of his life. Fair enough. But as for William Cholner, he was said to have produced £30,000 in counterfeit money, which is the equivalent of £4 million today. Not about buy England at that point. (laughs) (laughs) That is the story of William Cholner, the this man a, who made Isaac Newton's life a living hell. This is a good story. Have I not heard this story before? <laughs> this is a very good story. Story I of the Royal Mint and all of that. Nice. Yeah, you go. No, very interesting. I like that. Yes. Bit of history. Bit of yeah, history. Bit of history that I'm I did not tell you told. beforehand. You did. There would be history. I didn't believe you. <laughs> but there was history. It's crazy. Again, like that we don't know these stories and someone no. just goes, by the way, look up this. And then look just poof, the internet. All this stuff that actually happened. Mm. And the Royal Mint's history is really fun as well. It doesn't <laughs> seem like it would be fun. I had to spend a long time trying to work out coins, <laughs> which I never thought I'd have to do. No. And there were points again when you read through the Royal Mint's history, you're like, oh, I don't care how a no. coin was made. But the, the time in the Tower of London, all of this information was amazing mm. again to know what it was like to live there and isaac newton like after he had done all this work at cambridge and then spent the rest of his life less than next 30 years yeah it was the coins. master of the mint it would just sort of sat around master of the mint and going mm. i i invented things i invented many many I, things. optics have a telescope there you are <laughs> <That was, laughs> <for free. laughs> also it was very hard for me all the way through not to do the simpsons reference where homer passes out and Isaac Newton appears again. Homer, I'm your guardian angel. I've appeared as someone you would recognise and revere. Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac hoo-hoo. <laughs> oh, very well. Colonel Clink. <laughs> so there you go. What do you think of the old con artists? I mean, I mean, here yeah, that, that man had balls. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean the, the slight begrud- begrudging respect, really, yeah. for a man who just went for it. Yeah. Who just like, yeah, hey, look. No, I'm going to make my own way. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm looking after number one. So it's all about what can I get out of it and just go for it. He had a good system that he escaped prosecution for so long. Yeah. You know, he spent the odd spell in jail, like really minimal though, because he would just sell anyone else down the river. He just got a bit cocky at the end. This is always the way. He just got Mm. a bit overly cocky at the end and always less as petitioning government to say, I know Mm. what's wrong with the raw men. If he just stayed, if he just shut up and just carried on, he would be absolutely fine. I think Newton said that himself later. Yeah. Is that if he just stayed in, if he just stayed as a petty criminal, yeah, never and would have making known a about perfectly him. healthy amount of money, mm. living a, a great old life. And just, but now he got cocky. But maybe that is that they're hearing the news that the the Royal Mint is is all money is being mm. okay. Do over, start again. So all of your counterfeit coinage is done all that hard work you yeah. put into putting it into circulation is but being you, but, but wiped by that out point, you, but but once it's in circulation you've, you've got made your, your money you've made your money on yeah. it 
So then all he's going to think is, well, I'll get, I'll get the new coins, mm. and I'll start again. Uh, the, the, the but coins. they couldn't be. They couldn't. But that was the point: is that Newton being there, mm. those coins couldn't be replicated in the same way that you can spot a fake pound coin now a mile off yeah. because of the weight, the, the shape. You can't replicate those things. Interesting little thing. Do you know about the? I think it is the trial of the picks. No, <laughs> the trial of the picks is a ceremonial process that the royal mint do, and it started in the twelve hundreds. It continues today, sure but it, it is a process for ensuring every single coin is legitimate and is worthy of it. And it's it, it's actually quite complicated, but they do gather. They gather. There are judges <laughs> in, in robes. They do, they, they <laughs> By do, torchlight. But it's all sort of goldsmiths and like you know experts of this. And one person selects a bunch of coins at random. They have to do a certain process, as in there's a calculation, as in like, right, you need to have this many coins or whatever. They are all put in, and I think the picks is a box. Right. It's a wooden box. And they bring them round to people and go, oh, this is your this is your coin, take a coin. And it's their jobs to assess it on the spot, but also take three months to take those coins away. And they will melt them down. Hmm. They will check them. They will examine every single piece of them and then bring them back and say, these are authentic but just at random and they gather at certain times of year to go, this is authentic. And if they find any problems with it, yeah. then whoever is in charge of the mint can be fired and can be put in jail. <laughs> Look it up. It's a trial yeah. of the picks. I didn't go into it here, but there must be more articles about it. Oh. But And there's so many of those sort of weird, obscure sort of little ceremonies and things that mm. have just gone on for the past thousand years because... Yeah. Because that's all we've always done. Yeah. But then again, it's to show <laughs> that ev- literally anything, because it only mm. takes, you know, you can imagine how easy it would be to, for someone to take a mould, mm. to take something, to put it into production and then sort of, yeah, to, to shave off some money. Whatever it is, is that they, that's why they have these weird systems. No. There you are. The Royal Mint. Who knew it would be so fascinating? Who knew? <laughs> well, what do you think, people? What do you think of William and Sir Isaac Newton and the man who just, who really bothered him the whole time? <laughs> Isaac Newton and the counterfeiter. It's like, a, it's like a romance novel. It really is, yeah. It's quite <laughs> sexy. Barbara Cartman should write something about it. What do you think of William's methods? What do you think of Sir Isaac Newton? Do you know more about his history that you'd like to share? Well, what about the early dildo years? Uh, the dildo years. The dildo <laughs> years. I think that should be a whole book series. <laughs> really the dildo should. years. Uh, maybe Isaac Newton was very jealous. Maybe. Maybe he bought one. And, maybe he um, was yeah, a disgruntled customer from the old days. Disgruntled customer that it didn't pop out like quite and to surprise his friends. Tell us what you think. Jump on the comments of this episode. Share your thoughts, your feelings, your musings. But while you do, you must mix up an old money. Indeed, it's got another treat. Mm-hmm. Knock those back. <laughs> we did. <laughs> so, so yes, they're, they're very nice. The recipe <laughs> will be out this evening, as always. And mix it up if you can. The pear is a bit random. Mm. So not everyone will have the pear, but it's very nice. It's very nice. It's very nice. Well, the pear is a distinctive flavour and it's sweet. So mm. you might want to swap it for something else fruity. If you do experiment with this cocktail, just let us know what you're doing yeah, with it. You could probably do some triple sec maybe in there. Mm. If it had a pinch. Well, but that would make it more towards a margarita. It would, or some maraschino might be interesting. Maraschino might be good. Some, even some apricot brandy. Yeah, something you know, apple things, Something apple Bit of Calvados bit could of be Calvados. interesting. Throw it in there. Send us photos of any of the cocktails that you are enjoying this weekend. And by all means, ask us more questions about more stories that we can be covering in the future, more cocktails that we can be doing. And please do send us suggestions of things we need to be doing on episode 200. We want this to reflect the episodes and all of the stories that you love the most. If you can, please consider joining us on patreon.com. And go and leave us a five-star review if you love this show on Apple iTunes. Wherever you listen to your podcast, reviews make a massive amount of difference. Thanks for listening, guys. We have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week. And remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Oh, yeah.